DiscerningHearts.com, in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary, presents The Discernment of Spirits, Setting the Captives Free, with Father Timothy Gallagher. Father Gallagher is a popular retreat leader, Ignatian scholar, and a lecturer around the world who holds a doctorate from the Gregorian University and is the author of The Discernment of Spirits, The Examine Prayer, Meditation and Contemplation, and many other works based on the teachings of St. Ignatius of Loyola. And he can be seen on Living the Discerning Life on the Eternal Word Television Network. The Discernment of Spirits, Setting the Captives Free, with Father Timothy Gallagher. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. The Twelfth Rule, The Enemy Acts Like a Woman in Being Weak When Faced with Strength and Strong When Faced with Weakness. For, as it is proper to a woman, when she is fighting with some man, to lose heart and to flee when the man confronts her firmly, and on the contrary, if the man begins to flee, losing heart, the anger, vengeance, and ferocity of the woman grow greatly and know no bounds. In the same way, it is proper to the enemy to weaken and lose heart, fleeing and ceasing his temptations, when the person who is exercising himself in spiritual things confronts the temptations of the enemy firmly, doing what is diametrically opposed to them. And on the contrary, if the person who is exercising himself begins to be afraid and lose heart in suffering the temptations, there is no beast so fierce on the face of the earth as the enemy of human nature in following out his damnable intention with such growing malice. Welcome, Father Gallagher. Thanks, Chris. We're now on Rule 12, and the exercises takes an interesting turn here, doesn't it? It's a turn between from, well, really from one thing that is very similar to the other, but there is a turn. And the turn is from the spiritual desolation that we've been speaking about as we've said so often in these rules, basically what St. Ignatius is trying to do is to equip us to, well, the big three, as you say, Chris, be aware of spiritual desolation, just that heaviness of heart in the spiritual life when that's happening so that we can name it. It's the second step to understand what we're dealing with, which sets us free for the third step to take action in this case to reject it. So that that's the real focus of these rules thus far is to help us to deal with that heaviness of heart that sometimes happens in the spiritual life and which we said is, I think, for most of us, the main problem in the spiritual life so that nothing is more freeing than a knowledge of these rules in dealing with that kind of spiritual struggle. Now, the shift here is that St. Ignatius now focuses on a related tactic of the enemy, which is temptation. Spiritual desolation means a heaviness of heart on the level of my spiritual life. I don't feel any energy for prayer. God doesn't feel close. All the things we've been talking about. Whereas temptation is simply a deceptive suggestion of the enemy. Why don't you let your prayer go till later? You can let yourself see that. You've done it before and it hasn't gotten too far out of hand. Yes, you can go there. You can put yourself in that situation somehow, etc. Now, temptation may not have, at least initially, any heaviness of heart at all with it. In fact, again, at least initially, it can seem quite attractive. So that what St. Ignatius wants us now to see in the remaining three rules, 12, 13, and 14, in each of these rules is a quality of how the enemy works in his temptations. So that being aware of that and understanding it, we will know how to take directly the counteraction to negate the enemy's tactic. Knowledge of these three rules will help us enormously in dealing with the enemy's temptations. The reason why I say the shift, although it's there, is not huge, is because most of the time when we are in spiritual desolation, when our hearts are heavy, in, uh, spiritually speaking, temptations are floating in and out of that deceptive suggestions of the enemy, so that these two tra tactics are very often going to come together. So have, having pointed out the fact that there is, as you say, a turn in the rules, we don't have to insist now too much more upon it because it's the same enemy trying to get us to the same place and the same need to be aware of, understand, and take action to reject his tactics. What Ignatius does in the last three rules in each case is to present a kind of parable, sort of a symbolic figure or a metaphor just the outlines of a kind of story. And then like a good teacher in the second half of the rule is to pull the lesson out of the metaphor or the parable that he wants us to see. Sometimes his metaphor in uh, rule 12 um, 
can be a little difficult because Ignatius presents that rather unhappy situation which God certainly never intended of a man and a woman actually fighting. Obviously, God intends men and women to complement each other in mutual love. Now, that's to say that if something in this metaphor of the man and the woman fighting grates on us doesn't feel right, then we're hearing it well because it is a metaphor precisely of the enemy. In fact, in these last three rules, Ignatius expands the title from simply the enemy to the enemy of human nature. This is the one who is against everything that God intended human nature to be. So that we're going to find in the metaphor, in all three final rules, something that grates on us, something that doesn't seem right, precisely because it's a metaphor illustrating the way the enemy acts. I suppose as a word of caution that if we do hear this and we don't have a grating feeling, that's a, that's a sign too as well, isn't it? I would guess that it would be a sign that we haven't yet got the point that Ignatius really wants us to see. Because, But we'll see. The figures are so obvious. This very unhappy situation of a man and a woman fighting. Mm-hmm. In the next rule, it is uh, a man attempting to seduce and use an upright woman. Obviously, mm-hmm. the, the unnatural quality is there. And then in the final rule, it's the leader of a group of thieves who are attempting to pillage and sack and rob and destroy. So the, the unnatural quality the quality of the one who is the enemy of human nature is so evident in all three rules that it's actually, I I think, pretty hard to miss. Sometimes in dealing with rule 12, because this metaphor of a man fighting with a woman is difficult, authors will substitute other metaphors. And I think that can work. One of the substitutions one of the authors uses is parents and a spoiled child. Now, again, the the unnatural quality is there. God never intended children to be spoiled, but but it's a gentler Uh, Mm -hmm. situation than that rather strident situation of a man fighting with a woman. In fact, I think as we present this rule, we'll we'll use the parent and spoiled child uh, metaphor. Now, what Ignatius says then in Rule 12 is, he says, the enemy acts like a woman in being weak when faced with strength and strong when faced with weakness. Now, this is what Ignatius wants us to see, if we'll just set aside the metaphor for a moment, that the enemy is weak when faced with strength, when we're willing to stand strongly in the face of the enemy's temptations, the enemy's essential weakness is laid bare. Mm -hmm. And the enemy is strong when faced with weakness, when we are giving way and accepting and uh, saying, yeah, maybe I could let myself do that and so on, then the temptations will get stronger and stronger and stronger. So this is the key quality of the enemy that Ignatius wants us to see. And this is charged with hope because the basic message is that the enemy is no stronger than a spoiled child. Hmm. Let's play out the metaphor. You know those situations that you can see in public sometimes, maybe in uh, shopping malls or in airports, where a two to three year old spoiled child starts acting out. And you know how these situations can get completely out of hand. It's as though Ignatius says, here is the spoiled child, here are the parents in the public place, and the spoiled child starts acting out, just gets started, stops, cocks his head, looks out the side of his eye at his parents' faces. And if he sees that they're wringing their hands and supplicating and helpless, on he comes. And these situations can get completely out of control. Same spoiled child just gets started acting out, stops, cocks his head, looks at his parents' faces, and in his parents' eyes sees storm clouds gathering and swift justice about to descend. Mm. That's it. It's over. Because the only possibility the spoiled child has of this kind of acting out is the weakness of his parents in dealing with him. If they choose to be firm, the situation will end right at its very start. And this, Ignatius says, is the way the enemy is in his temptations. And so Ignatius now moves from the metaphor to the teaching he wants us to see. In the same way, Ignatius says, it is proper to the enemy to weaken. I love this language. We don't think of the enemy as weak, do we? We think of ourselves as very weak and helpless. And as the enemy, you know, when I'm sitting there at 930 alone in my room, nothing in me wants to pray. God feels far away. And here's the remote control, and there's the TV, or here's the mouse, which can take me places I really should not go on the computer. I can feel very weak and very helpless in the face of these things. Like, it's almost inevitable that I'm going to give in. And we'll hear that voice. You've given in so many times before. You're going to fall this time as well. And we feel very weak, and the enemy seems very strong to us. And that's what Ignatius wants to undo in this rule. The truth is very different. So when we are willing to be strong in facing the temptation, why don't you let your prayer go till later? No, I said I was going to pray at this time. I'm going to pray exactly as I planned. Then Ignatius says, It is proper to the enemy to weaken and lose heart 
I love that language too. If we think of the enemy as losing heart, fleeing and ceasing his temptations. And let's just think again of the enemy fleeing, ceasing, giving up with his temptations. When the person who is exercising himself in spiritual things confronts the temptations of the enemy firmly, doing what is diametrically opposed to them, you're going to pray at this time. Why don't you let your prayer go till later? No, I am going to pray exactly as planned. Just doing exactly the opposite of what the enemy is suggesting. However, on the contrary, Ignatius says, if the person who is exercising himself in spiritual things, the person who loves the Lord and is trying to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus, begins to be afraid and lose heart in suffering the temptations. Why don't you let your prayer go till later? Yeah, I don't quite feel like it right now. I do feel a little tired. Maybe I could get it in later. Okay, begins to be afraid and so on. There is no beast so fierce on the face of the earth as the enemy of human nature. There you see he's the one who is against human nature in following out his damnable intention with such growing malice. Let's say here is a high mountain covered with snow. And up here on the peak of the mountain, a snowball is just getting started. You can put out a single finger and stop it. Let it get halfway down the mountainside, gaining mass and speed. It'll run you over. Mm -hmm. If that person who planned to pray at that time in the day begins to say, yeah, maybe I could pray later. I don't quite feel like it now. Should be. Will that person ever pray at all that day? In the book, I call this rule, I entitle the chapter on this rule, Standing Firm in the Beginning. Because that's where this rule leads. If this is true, if there is a snowball effect to the enemy's temptations, and the enemy's only strength in his temptations is our giving way, like the parents and the spoiled child, then the conclusion is very clear. The key moment in responding to the enemy's temptations is the very beginning, when they first present themselves to us. And if we are willing to stand firm in that beginning, the snowball will never even get started. Mm -hmm. We will save ourselves so much sorrow and pain. When is it easiest, for example, with the internet, to stop ourselves from seeing what we should not see and going where we should not go with all the harm that that can bring? The easiest time is before I even reach out and before the first click. If one click leads to 20, to 50, to 100, grace can always work. God's grace is always available to us, but it will get harder and harder. And I'm sure as I'm saying this that we can all recognize the truth of this. The longer we let the temptation go, the harder it gets. And if we have the wisdom and with God's grace, the courage to, to say no right in the very beginning, our spiritual lives will become enormously easier. I love this rule, and I, I kind of have a prayer in my heart as we're saying this, that those of us listening will never forget it, because it can make an enormous difference in our lives. Really, if we think of this in biblical terms, this is the difference between the way Eve responds to the tempter in Genesis 3. Did God really say? Well, no, God said. And the dialogue begins, and she listens, and she answers, and the, temp the snowball gets started down the mountain, and it does run her over. Now, grace is going to, redemption is still going to happen, but there's enormous sorrow and pain that comes from this. The difference between that and Jesus' response to the enemy in the desert when he is there for the 40 days after the baptism. Turn these stones into bread. And Jesus immediately responds with the word of God. It is written, not by bread alone shall man live it, and the rest. And it's over. Father Gallagher, for those who are entering into that depth of prayer, they would desire in their hearts to be receptive to the promptings of the Lord in, in directions that he may be trying to lead them. And I guess where I'm going with this question is, what does the soul do that, how do they discern between the temptation to veer from the path that God has designed and the desire to follow a prompting where the Lord may be leading them? How does that work in the discernment? Well, everything we've said before that Ignatius has said earlier in the rules about spiritual consolation and spiritual desolation matters precisely because of this. If the change that I'm thinking of making is coming at a time when if I am, again, the big three, if I'm aware and, and understanding and the rest, that suggested change is coming at a time when I can recognize that I'm in spiritual desolation, then I have all the clarity to know 
that this is not of God. This is not a change I should make. That's our famous rule five. In time of spiritual desolation, never make such changes. If I am in a time of spiritual consolation, on the other hand, then I have another indication. If there's joy in my heart, and I'm thinking of in the Lord, and I feel God's closeness, and I'm thinking of reaching out in love to a family member in a new way, as Jesus would teach us, or to maybe taking up um, a new practice of um, the sacraments, maybe getting to daily mass when it's when it fits with my other commitments and I can do it, or to confession more frequently, or, or spiritual reading in some new way, then I have a whole other uh, uh, indication that this very much may be a, of the Lord. Finally, I would say, if we ever have uh, questions of this kind that we can't answer, we do our best, and we're just not sure whether the thought of making this change or taking this new step really is of the Lord or not, that leads us to Ignatius' 13th rule that we'll be getting to in our next conversation, in which Ignatius counsels us not to be alone in the spiritual life, but if at all possible, to speak at such times with a person of spiritual wisdom, an experienced, wise, competent spiritual guide, uh, who can help us to see more clearly than we can for ourselves in such times. Which is to say that these rules for discernment, of which we've been speaking uh, these, these days, for Ignatius are, are never rules that we live purely on our own. But, you know, as, as, he, as the scripture says from the start, it is not good for man to be alone. It just isn't good for us to be alone. And that applies in everything and certainly very much in the spiritual life. So that's kind of the bottom line answer. If we're not sure, then if there is any way to find spiritual guidance from a wise spiritual person, that would be the best of all things. We'll return in just a moment to... The Discernment of Spirits, Setting the Captives Free, with Father Timothy Gallagher. We now return to The Discernment of Spirits, Setting Captives Free, with Father Timothy Gallagher. This is from a letter that St. Ignatius wrote to a, a very dedicated disciple of the Lord, uh, the, the Sister Teresa de Hadel, lived in Barcelona. And he writes to her and says that if the enemy sees that we are weak and much humbled by his harmful thoughts, his temptations, or burdens, and the rest, he goes on. The snowball starts going on down the mountain further to suggest that we are entirely forgotten by God our Lord and leads us to think that we are quite separated from him and that all that we have done, all that we desire to do is entirely worthless. He thus endeavors to bring us to a state of general discouragement. Now, by the time we get to that general discouragement, the snowball is pretty far down the mountain. And I think with just a little bit of reflection, all of us can recognize times that we have not stood firm in the beginnings. And the snowball has gotten heavier, and the discouragement has grown, and we've let prayer go, and we've stopped going to the activity in the parish. We can get to that state of general discouragement, which, which is where the enemy wants to lead us, because once we're there, we're open to all kinds of harm in the spiritual life. And this is why, again, I would just really beg all of us to never forget Rule 12. If we live the wisdom, the wisdom of Rule 12, the snowball will stop right at the peak or pretty close to it. And much sorrow, much pain, as we've been saying, will be spared. We'll be spared that in the spiritual life. Well, uh, Ignatius also mentions early on in his own life of conversion, when he had gone across Spain to Manresa in the months that he spent of intense prayer, the time when he wrote most of the spiritual exercises. Mm -hmm. At one point, uh, as he's dedicating himself to a life of penance and prayer and service of the poor, 
and growing enormously in God. A thought came to trouble him, he says, by pointing out the hardships of his life, as if someone were saying within his soul, someone, mm -hmm. how will you be able to endure this life for the 70 years you have yet to live? In other words, uh, it's heavy now, it's hard to live this life of fidelity to the Lord, there's a price to pay, it's difficult, it's just going to keep being as difficult as it is now and get harder, it's going to be year after year after year of heaviness and darkness in the spiritual life. Remember how the enemy claims power over to predict the spiritual future. And Ignatius goes on to say that he very quickly recognizes this as the enemy and simply rejects the thought and that is over and simply he's set free from that. That's the dynamic of rule 12. I'm also remembering as I say this a conversation with, um, I'll call him Steve. Steve today is a wonderful priest. At this time, he was a seminarian, and I share this with Steve's permission, of a retreat he was making just a few weeks before his ordination to the diaconate, which was the decisive decision for priesthood for the rest of his life. That's the point where the future priest takes his commitment to celibacy and to the, actually enters the state of holy orders as a deacon. And on the evening of this one day in the retreat, just not feeling too energetic, um, going to his time of prayer, shortening the prayer. Well, there's rule five material, isn't it? In a time mm -hmm. of desolation, changing a plan that he had had in place before the desolation began. Going to bed, waking up in the morning a bit late, not very happy with the way things were going, beginning to get frustrated, not feeling God's closeness anymore. Uh, by now we're simply describing spiritual desolation. You can see a snowball gaining mm -hmm. speed and mass. And then midway through the morning, the thought coming to him, look at you, if you can't even handle these small things, praying as you plan to do it, uh, going on with the retreat, the way everyone else is doing, how are you ever going to handle the major responsibilities of priesthood for the rest of your life? At this point, the sequence has gotten pretty deadly. Here's a thought attacking the very vocation itself on the verge of the definitive commitment to it. Now, as Steve tells the story, he went to speak to the retreat director, which is perfect. That's going to be our rule 13 tells this story and the retreat director is able to help him see clearly that this is just the classic tactic of the enemy. This is desolation and the thoughts that arise in desolation and the enemy's attempt to discourage. Steve is able to see it clearly, to reject it. With the director's help, he's able to do the big three that he was not able to do on his own. He becomes aware of what's going on. He can understand that this is the enemy's tactic and now he's able to to take good steps to reject it, which is why I said earlier that we're not really ever meant to be alone in this. Steve is not able at this point to do this on his own, but with the help of a wise spiritual person, he's able to do this. Well, Steve is ordained today. The enemy's tactic was negated. But let's ask this question. What if that evening before Steve, when he was tempted to shorten his prayer, had not shortened his prayer, had been faithful to the full time his planned? Would the snowball ever have gotten any larger? Would it have ever gotten any further down the mountainside? Would that troubling thought attacking the very vocation itself the following morning ever happen? There's a good likelihood that none of that would have happened. And that's the wisdom of Rule 12. Now, here is a, uh, a line from the famous classic rule of St. Benedict, one of the great writings in the history of the church. And this is a section which he entitles The Instruments of Good Works. And he just gives short little sayings. This is the 50th of them of tools which will help us to live the spiritual life. And he says, as soon as wrongful thoughts come into your heart, now you can hear that's the heart of Rule 12, as soon as, right at the very beginning, wrongful thoughts, temptations, and the enemy's troubling suggestions come into your heart. So this is exquisitely Rule 12 spiritual territory. When I do this with groups, I love to stop at this point and invite people to try to complete that sentence themselves in the light of the rules. And it's wonderful to hear what people say. This is how St. Benedict concludes it. As soon as wrongful thoughts come into your heart, dash them against Christ, which is a beautiful thing. Right away, it's as though you have a good solid rock and you take some old rather misshapen piece of pottery or something and you shatter it against the rock so that it shatters into a thousand pieces and can never ever take shape again. As soon as wrongful thoughts come into your heart, why don't you let your prayer go till later? You can let yourself see that this time and, and the rest. Dash them against Christ. And he goes on to say and disclose them to your spiritual father, which is rule 13. Speak with a wise spiritual person about them. There's also a... Um, a moment in the life of St. Francis of Assisi, which is recounted in one of the biographies written shortly after his death. 
And this biography says, The saint therefore made it a point to keep himself in joy of heart and to preserve the unction of the spirit and the oil of gladness, quoting Psalm 45. He avoided with the greatest care the miserable illness of dejection, and here's rule 12 now, so that if he felt it coming over his mind even a little, there's right at the very beginning, right at the top of the mountain when the snow, coming over his mind even a little, he would have recourse very quickly to prayer, which is perfect. It's the intuition of the saints. Just as the temptation is getting started immediately, he turns to prayer. For he would say, if the servant of God, as may happen, as it will to us too, is disturbed in any way, he should rise immediately to pray and should remain in the presence of the Heavenly Father until he restores unto him the joy of salvation. So that's Rule 12. It's amazing to me that even in the wonderful examples of St. Benedict and St. Francis, we realize that even the great saints went through this type of activity, this type of temptation that Rule 12 attempts to remedy over and over and over again. Which makes a very interesting point, and that is that St. Ignatius really isn't inventing anything in these rules. And that's why when people go through them, what they find is, they find themselves saying is, that's exactly it, that's what happens. I didn't have words for it, but St. Ignatius has given me words for it now. What St. Ignatius is doing is finding words for the way God works, or Ignatius says the good spirit, and the way the enemy works mm -hmm. in everyone. And so that's why, as you read the saints, you can find St. Ignatius' rules everywhere because uh, anyone who reflects on his or her spiritual life is going to recognize in what St. Ignatius is writing that this is, what, this is just the way things work in the spiritual life. Actually, that's how I came to be able to quote these various saints because once I'd gotten to know the rules a bit, mm -hmm. as I continued to read the lives and experience of saints, it was very clear to see these kinds of connections. You say, oh, there it is, in St. Benedict, in St. Francis, in St. Therese, St. Elizabeth Seton, and really all of the saints, because this is simply what happens in the spiritual life. But once we know it, once with St. Ignatius' help we have words for it, then the big three can become real. We can be aware of it, we can understand what's going on, and the captives are set free, as we've said so often, to take spiritual action either to accept the work of the good spirit through consolation or to reject the enemy's traps through spiritual desolation and his temptations. Thank you, Father Gallagher. My privilege as always. You've been listening to The Discernment of Spirits, Setting Captives Free with Father Timothy Gallagher. To hear and or download this episode along with many others, go to discerninghearts.com. The Discernment of Spirits Setting Captives Free is a production of DiscerningHearts.com in cooperation with the Oblates of the Virgin Mary. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Join us next time for The Discernment of Spirits Setting Captives Free with Father Timothy Gallagher.